actually, I'm going to give you a talk about the other end of the spectrum uh, compared to crowdsourcing crowd sourcing and lawmaking. And uh, my point today is to give you another very quick overview of what is possible today in terms of techniques to perform what some call semantic pooling on social media with several examples. So what is possible technically as well as what is done and what could be done. And this raises, uh, of course, a lot of questions, as we will see. So uh, first, a very short word about Simiocast. Since 2009, we've been analyzing what consumers, mostly, uh, and citizens, uh, sometimes, say online, including on, on social media like Twitter, Facebook, or Weibo, the Chinese counterpart, or blogs and forums, and so on. And we did uh, several published work on, on um, semantic polling on elections, uh, starting with French regional elections 2010, then the UK general election, and so on. And last published work was done for the French government on climate change, how people debate climate change in six countries. Um, what should you, you should be aware of, uh, you probably know, but a large number of citizens actually, beyond the crowdsourcing in lawmaking process initiatives, a large number of people, large number of citizens discuss politics online, including on Twitter, Facebook, blogs, uh, newspaper, website, and so on. A recent figure we, did, we found in October, a um, few weeks ago, 1.2% of all public tweets in France are about politics. Uh, of course, French love politics, uh, but still, that's quite a large number. It's larger than the number of tweets about Justin Bieber, which is very, very large. Um, it's less that in this given week, the number of tweets about soccer. I mean, uh, they prefer soccer to politics, of course, makes sense. Um, citizens do not necessarily follow the journalist agenda, and in, this is a, a very um, example we, take, we took from the, our study of climate change. Uh, you've got CNN that just provided different coverage through the years in terms of number of articles, starting with the, the conference in Copenhagen, which they, they made more than 30 articles, while in Durban they made less than 10. Yet, the comments on CNN, on the very same website, did not follow the same trend. Citizens do not follow the agenda set by journalists online. And the other uh, teaching from this is everyday life just gives you an opportunity to discuss political uh, aspects or political things, such as climate change. And this is what we, we call the, the groundhog day. You know, we analyzed the number of tweets about climate change, global warming, between November 2011 and February 2012, and the highest peak was not during the conference, which occurred in December. It was on February the 2nd. And why? Because the temperature was so high that a lot of people in the US said, oh, this is global warming happening today. And some said, this is nice for me. And others said, we have to fix this. So everyday life gives opportunities to discuss political uh, stakes. Now, I will quickly give you this overview about the state of the art of what could be done. Um, typically, when we started in 2010, uh, analyzing what people, citizens say online, volume and sentiment was the benchmark. It's a way to do benchmarking like traditional posters. And here you got an example from French political elections. And we are very happy to say that more, nearly two million of tweets about Francois Hollande in May 2012 and so on. So he ranked first. So it's very nice because you look like a traditional poster. But of course, <coughs> volume is a very difficult problem. And actually, it does not depend on whatever confidence citizens have for uh, political figures, but more about buzzes and media coverage. And it's very important to know that all volume measures are approximative. To date, no two different companies provided the same figure in terms of volume for political figures on social media. And, and uh, our stance at Semiocas is that you cannot provide a number at the very exact number in terms of tweets. Because you've got Francois Hollande, for example. Hollande is just name of country in French. You've got David Cameron, Gordon Brown. Uh, of course, Nick Legg is easier, but still. And all the, the, the Twitter users are going to use new words. They're just forging for, for the very uh, purpose of discussing politics. So volume is a very difficult problem. Uh, now, of course, if volume is a difficult problem, sentiment is just hard. And um, the thing is, 
usually it's meaningless, actually. This is something we discovered the last three years. I mean, uh, journalists love sentiment. Just for a little story, when we went to see journalists and say, we want to track what people say online about regional elections, uh, we were just, hey, look, we're going to do volume. This is great, this is a challenge. Uh, and, and of course, journalists said, uh, the, uh, um, they, they, they said, mm, I want sentiment. And then I was trying to discuss, but we, we can't do sentiment. Eventually, we did sentiment, but still, it was a real challenge. And for political tweets, the only way that you can achieve something better than random is doing it manually or using machine learning, which is basically the same. You just manually a lot of tweets, and then the, the computer just generalizes. I'm saying this after we at Semicas did manual tagging of more than thousands and thousands of tweets in both English and French considering politics. So this is hard. And, and the thing is, it's usually not very really useful. But when you combine volumes and sentiments, and this is starts to be more interesting, you can have what we call panels, and you can group individuals based on what they say. So in this very example, we did analyze what people say online during the French primary uh, election for the Parti Socialiste in 2011. Just to give you some perspective, the first TV debates, there were six candidates. And uh, the, the second TV debate, there were only the two finalists. And journalists and analysts just were wondering whether people who voted for Arnaud Montebourg or for uh, Ségolène Royal were going to vote for François Hollande, who eventually won, or for uh, Martine Aubry. So what we did, we looked at what people say um, during the first debate, and we just defined a panel of people who just, their Twitter users were just definitely in favor of Martin Aubry, or in favor of Manuel Valls, or in favor of uh, Arnaud Montebourg. And during the, the second TV debate, live, uh, we analyzed how they reacted towards Martin Aubry or uh, François Hollande. So as you can see in this graph, a uh, lot of people we were in favor of, of Manuel Valls were actually in favor of, of François Hollande, which, of course, you don't need to, to look at tweets to know about this. Every analyst knew this, uh, for sure. But it was not so clear about Arnaud Montebourg and uh, uh, Ségolène Royal. Sources also uh, just gives you a very clear idea of who is discussing a given topic. Of course, this is not representative. Of course, uh, people are speaking from various sources of various social networks and so on. In this example, we've been tracking what people say about uh, the IMF director a uh, given week. And uh, what, people's, what, what happens is journalists in France are more likely to discuss this very French uh, ep episode that just occurs to, to Christine Lagarde, while on Twitter, you have a lot more people expressing themselves from Spain. And why? Because people in Spain were very unhappy about what IMF was doing to Spain this very week. And uh, eventually, you can break down what people say about a given topic and find weak signals. Uh, in, in the example on the left, we analyze what people are saying about Laurent Vauquier, which is a second-tier uh, French politician. And um, he, he just appeared on TV. It was two weeks ago. He appeared on TV, and he just gave his ideas about a lot of topics, including uh, giving money to people when they are ill, when they can't work. He, he's against this. Or um, he, he, watched, he just said that he was against same-sex marriage uh, and that he would re reverse uh, the law that was passed in France about this. And what we can analyze very quickly is there is 71% of all conversations about this Laurent Vauquier uh, this given week that are about same-sex marriage, which is a topic very interesting for these people, while everything he said, for example, uh, about uh, the municipal election, the campaign that's starting, uh, just do not interest that many people. So we can analyze this. And eventually, we can find very small topics. And this is very interesting for political figures, because we can say, this is the example on the right, a given topic is rising slowly. In the example on the right, you've got well, a, one a French um, politician who just happened to have been a lawyer for Monsanto and passed a law later on allowing genetically modified uh, food in organic food. Um, and uh, very few people are discussing this. But we found out that there's still some do. And we can track this and monitor and say, at what point this is going to be a problem for this person. So this is a very transition to what is used today in terms of all the tools. I just told, gave you what the tools are and now how it's used today. 
uh, the typical use case is monitoring, because as a political figure, uh, and, and Charles Kennedy will probably confirm, you want to know what people say about you online because of your, for many reasons, and uh, you, you can also analyze on social media how citizens react and compare this with how journalists react and media react. And this ver very easily applies to TV debates, which are uh, qu quite important for political figures. So this is the first use case. The second use case is assessing citizens' opinion on a very specific topic, for example, climate change or employment or same-sex marriage or whatever. So you can map the online debate and find out what are the arguments that you can foster online. And the third use case, which I'm happy to say we haven't done at the moment, is, but it is possible nevertheless, and I won't stress it, you can look up individuals. You can look up individuals. This can be scary. This is a question we had, actually. Can you find you Twitter users who are discussing housing problems, housing issues, and who are living in Paris? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. We can find them. We can list them. I mean, people discuss online on all kind of topics, and if you want to be elected in Paris and you think that housing issues is a very important problem, you might be tempted to find these people and discuss with them and, and tell them to go to vote for you. So you can look up individuals using social media research today. So just to, to conclude, semantic polling requires cutting edge technology. I didn't develop, uh, and Tanya actually gives an idea of the kind of technology we also use, but it requires cutting edge technology. It complements traditional pollster methods, but it raises ethical questions when applied to individuals. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.